सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली एट टाइम द होल वर्ल्ड सीम्स टू बी इन टर्मोइल एंड देंटर सीम्स टू बी यूक्रेन एंड एवरीबडीज अटेंशन इज फोकस देयर और देर इन indo pacific or taiwan or places like that the middle east it seems has the fear of missing out fomo as young people call it and so they will not be left out of headlines and once again they've been led in this by the iraqis because iraq in fact has been particularly peaceful by its standards in the post saddam era remember in october last year i think it was our episode 873 and i will share a link with you we had actually following a show by farid zakaria where it said look democracy may be in decline everywhere else in the world but in an unlikely place it was actually improving and that was iraq and that that's when iraq had just had its election so after that the fact is and this is something that i'm sure most people in india have missed out on at least i had missed out on i must confess that while that was a great election and a fair election and everybody hailed it as a big democratic success in an unlikely place that a middle eastern arab country middle eastern arab islamic all of it mostly shia even more so but the fact is that since then the country has had no government now why has the country had no government and what is the upshot that became evident on the streets of baghdad and not just anywhere in baghdad but what is called as the green zone now the green zone is something that we might loosely describe as latians delhi or maybe the ndmc zone in delhi which is federally controlled or centrally controlled where no other political powers retrans because that is where the seat of the government is located foreign embassies foreign organizations everybody is there so that is particularly secure now that was that was invaded by the supporters of this 48 year old cleric called muqtada al sadr so we'll tell you more about him because i'm not even quite sure formally we can call him call him a cleric although he'd like to be called as one uh, but his supporters they invaded the place they invaded the place and a lot of the people maybe the law and order controlling forces maybe the armed forces units maybe militias maybe funny guys posing as militias because a lot of funny guys have militias in iraq i shall tell you about this in a minute as we go along they opened fire and looks like at least 15 of the supporters of muqtada al sadr were killed more than 100 were injured there were lots of tweets last night i saw from baghdad people saying this is beginning beginning to sound like the war it's beginning to sound like the war is back some saying it's beginning to sound like the war in battle in mosul so on and so forth as we stand now as we record now as dramatically as this trouble had grown looks like the same muqtada al sadr has now said that look he wants peace he does not want any pangas he told his he told his supporters to calm down and withdraw he's even said that he'll go on to a fast until peace is restored now who's this character the whole world is full of interesting characters the middle east is full of interesting characters but muqtada al sadr a mere 48 born in 1974 is actually the character of characters he is born he is born in a very devout family of clerics his father in fact was a grand ayatollah of the shias his name was grand ayatollah that's a title grand ayatollah muhammad muhammad sadiq al sadr that's not a typo muhammad muhammad twice muhammad muhammad sadiq al sadr in the 90s after 1990 when saddam hussein lost the first gulf war but survived he stayed on in power of the first gulf war after the allied forces went and liberated kuwait there was a big shiite rebellion in iraq and he was seen to have somehow led that shiite rebellion 
Now, you know, Iraq has a very complex history and very complex demography. The demography is that Iraq is a fair-sized Arab country in the Middle East, not definitely not as big as uh, Iran, but a fair-sized Middle Eastern country. 70% of it is Shia, 30% of it is Sunni. That is as per the CIA data. You can go to the CIA website. That's the beauty of some of these intelligence agencies. They actually put out a lot of interesting and important data on their websites. So you can go to the CIA website. But when Saddam ruled it, all of Saddam's group or Saddam's junta or Saddam's mafia, you could describe it depending on where you belonged in that debate. That was almost entirely Sunni. Of that also, the real elite, the ruling elite within the Sunni elite, the elite of the elite came from a small place called Tikrit, which is in the north, if I remember correctly, not far from Mosul. So that was also called the Tikrit, Tikriti Mafia. Saddam Hussein ran pretty much a secular government, pretty much was a mix of left and some revolutionary ideology, etc. That's what Ba'ath Party was all about. And that's what, that's what Ba'athism was all about. So he led his country, Iraq, into a war with Iran for several years that you know all about. Now, this was very strange that a Shia majority country ruled by a Sunni minority had launched had, had launched war on a purely Shia country where the home of the Shia theology resided. That is Qom and a country run by the Ayatollahs. That is the contradiction that lay in Iraq's demography and Iraq's political history. So once Saddam weakened, Iraq's Shias then were rallied by Muqtada al-Sadr's father into some kind of a rebellion, although it never became open, but he was widely blamed for it. And it became evident by 1999 that Saddam Hussein wanted him put away and he knew it. And in fact, he was very defiant. He kept on fighting for the rights, what he saw as the rights of Shias or equality for Shias or the Shia preeminence in Iraq. And he said he doesn't care about any threats from Saddam Hussein. In fact, for his last recorded Friday sermon, he went wearing, he went clad in a funeral shroud and he said that, I am showing you that I have no fear of death and all Shias should give up the fear of death. He was coming out after a sermon in Najaf, which is a holy Shia city. The two holiest Shia cities are, are Najaf and Karbala. Both are located in Iraq. And the fact is that millions of Iranian pilgrims go there every year. And I've had the good fortune of having visited both, albeit during the, 90, during the 1991 war. And also, unfortunately, at a time when the highways were completely clogged with families of Iraqi soldiers, families carrying bodies of Iraqi soldiers who had died in that war, these are very imposing places. So he was coming out of the mosque in Najaf and there he was assassinated in 1999. At that point, Muqtada al-Sadr was 25 years old. Since then, he grew. Now, he is an interesting guy. He grew, he really wanted to be an Ayatollah, a qualified Shiaist religious preacher, cleric or leader. He is, as we, as we just told you, he was the son of the Grand Ayatollah of Iraq. He was also married to the daughter of another Grand Ayatollah of the Shiites, that is, the, that is Grand Ayatollah Muhammad Bakir al-Sadr, who was also quite famous and quite defiant of the Sunni domination of the Shia majority in Iraq. Now, he tried, at one point, he raised an army, that is the Mahdi army. What is Mahdi army? Imam Mahdi, in the Shia worldview, is the 12th Imam, who will inevitably come back and cleanse us all, cleanse the entire world of all injustices and untruth, etc., etc. So he named his private militia Mahdi Army. It was the most powerful Shiite, Shiite militia for quite some time. In 2006, he fought a famous battle, the Battle of Basra, you can Google it, against the Iraqi forces, obviously uh, helped along by the Americans or maybe uh, American forces. Uh, under the cover of Iraqis and he lost that battle. Once he lost that battle, he actually went to Iran 
to educate himself and become and pass his exams and become a proper ayatollah, a former ayatollah. But he failed at that and he came back. But what he did not fail at was populism. And it was that populism, for a long time he was seen as a terrorist, but he began to clean up his act. So what was Mahdi army in the course of time became peace company. He said he will not fight anybody and he will give up, give up arms. Nobody gives up arms so easily. But the fact is, by that time, because ISIS had begun to grow in the north of Iraq and that happened because the government of Nouri al-Maliki ran a very, very bigoted Shia government which really victimized the Sunnis. And these Sunnis included the top brass, the cream of the Iraqi army as inherited from Saddam's time. So all those families, all those might be an exaggeration, but a vast majority of those then out of anger walked into Islamic State's arms, locks, stock, barrel, tanks, artillery guns, everything. And that's how IS to begin with came to acquire almost like a regular army, oil wells, and that's how they took control of Mosul, etc. So the real fighting for ISIS was done by these trained, qualified soldiers, battle-hardened soldiers of Iraqi army. Nouri al-Maliki had done it. After that, some kind of a balancing began in Iraq. Now, this last year's election, 2021, was seen as a culmination of that balancing. So a fair election was held in Iraq. The problem once again was that while it was a fair election, it produced a very mixed up result. Iraq has a parliament of 329. It, it's also a funny system in Iraqi parliament. Iraq used to have proportionate representation earlier, but you know, proportionate representation with this kind of, this kind of demography can have a problem because they say, all right, in that case, is 70-30, 70% Shia, 30% Sunni, or this, this percent Kurds, this percentage, uh, this percent Yazidi, etc., etc., etc. To get around it, because people, because people of one, one stream are also concentrated in certain areas, so to create some kind of national integrity in Iraq, because Iraq also has a strong nationalism, the country was divided into 83 constituency groups. So each constituency group had an election. So in each constituency group, some there were some constituencies which had Shia num more of Shia numbers. In fact, most had more of Shia numbers, but some had others also. So instead of segregating their electorates or doing proportionate representation, now they created this constituency groups. In that election, the largest number of seats won by, won by who? But Muqtada al-Sadr. So he went, he won 73 seats. Now in a house of 329, 74 is not good enough. In a house of 329, 165 is majority. Now how do you get a majority in a house of 329 when the leading party wins 73? All right, you went to, you, you go to look for other parties, but that is where this parliamentary election threw up many complications. Now it is this election where the numbers threw up a threw up a complexity. Now, if I may, if I may try to explain it in cricketing terms, in a in a total score of 329, if a team's total score was 329, one batter got a 50, right? That is Muktada Al Sadar. That batter got 73. After that, no batter got a 50. Six batters, on the other other hand, got into double figures. I think three into the 30s. So six got into double figures, 26 failed to get double figures but had seats, 43 independents won. And in fact, even the other 26 who failed to get into double figures, other 26 parties, 23 parties got less than five seats and 17 batters scored only a single, right? In this situation, how do you put together a group of 100 and 65. That became a problem. So nobody was able to form a government. Also what happened in this election, very interestingly, but very significantly, is the groups, Shia groups that were supported by the, by the Iranians, who had so far held sway in Iraq. 
they lost out very badly and muqtada al sadr thrashed them demolished them so say nuri al maliki's party which would have thought that they would have a chance they got 33 then progress party which is a new party founded by mohammad al habusi got 37 so together also they did not get 70 and then you go ahead then kdp which is the kurdish democratic party that got 31 seats kurdish coalition got 17 seats so muqtada al sadr first try to set up a government in partnership with kurds and some others because muqtada al sadr unlike nuri al maliki and others is an iraqi nationalist he says all iraqis are one we should not his people should not discriminate against or victimize not just the sunnis but also kurds yazidis and others so he is an iraqi nationalist and styles himself as one also he's been even protecting christians in fact at one point when there were some incidents against christians in what is called as sadr city this used to be called saddam city in the past uh, but now called sadr city it also has a lot of poor people his workers had walked around wearing giant uh, their dresses or cloaks painted with gi- giant crucifixes to say that we defend christian so he is that kind of a character that's the reason i said is a character of character so he now said if there can be if if i cannot form a government there will be no government so as a result for 10 months now iraq has had no government and because iraq has had no government a caretaker government is going on and that caretaker government has even failed to pass a budget you remember the last time we did this cut the clutter episode on iraq in october last year one reason was the election took place the other was that, that was just on the day a drone attack had taken place on the house of iraqi prime minister mustafa al qadimi three drones were sent two were shot down by his air defense one came and crashed there but did not kill anybody but caused some a fair bit of debris in the household of course the shiite his shiite opponents then from sort of the more extreme parties who it was insinu- insinuated but behind this they said why would we waste time killing a facebook prime minister there are many easy and more effective and more certain ways of killing him he is doing it as a drama but the fact is that mustafa al qadimi has continued to be the prime minister since then but prime minister without any power and it was in that vacuum that in june muqtada al sadr said the cloak i am not joining this government and he asked all his mps members of parliament to also resign now if they resign parliament is left with nothing in july he also got his people to pitch tent near par- near the national parliament so no mps could access national parliament on august 3 he gave a call for a fresh flash election now his idea was that if a snap election takes place now obviously that he will win but once this violence broke out why did the violence broke out because he now it seems because he wanted to increase pressure for a fresh election he said i am retiring from politics i have nothing to do with politics and my workers also should give up politics that means if one big mainstream party the biggest mainstream party in any democratic system however imperfect it may be says that they are now out of politics then the whole politics goes into a spin and that is what happened now if i read global media and experts and think tanks it looks like he did this to increase pressure for a fresh election any which way it led to chaos and those chaos we see right now unfolding in front of our eyes as we speak looks like the trouble might be contained right now but the fact is that a very important country among the five largest oil reserves in the world is once again in political uncertainty for more than a year so what was seen as a big successful political experiment in october of 2021 with the last election has actually given us some of the worst aspects of a democratic system which is what happens when a people are not able to give anybody a majority and when the political system is not matured enough for people who might disagree with each other to come together and form a government see the example of israel in israel there's always a coalition government but they always set up a coalition government by bringing together people who otherwise bitterly oppose each other if you look at the current coalition in israel that also has the arab list parties in it they are people 
of Arab origin who live in Israel. They have nothing in common with the Israeli right. If anything, they have a lot of tension between them and there is a lot of history of hostility. But when you have the democratic temper, you are able to build a government. That has not happened in Iraq and that is what these incidents have reminded us of. And you know what, some of you complain that CTC becomes too long, so I've been trying to make it shorter. And sometimes in trying to make it shorter, I miss out a few points. So yesterday's CTC, where we talked about floods in Pakistan, I obviously forgot to tell you about why it may have happened, why this kind of uneven rainfall would have come. So if you see the Met data, I'm no Met expert. I read, first of all, that this year, the world, particularly the Pacific region, is facing what is called as La Nina. La Nina means little girl. It's the opposite of El Nino. So El Nino, which means the little boy, it's Spanish, which could also be like the little Christ. That's a phenomenon where waters of the Pacific become warmer than usual. La Nina is the opposite of it. It's also called anti-El Nino. So a lot of the weather patterns, particularly monsoons, are governed by, are influenced by what, what is called as ENSO, that is El Nino's Southern Oscillation Phenomenon. This year, the opposite of that has happened. When the opposite of that happens, then you can have unusual rainfalls, particularly very heavy monsoons, say, in India, Pakistan, etc., etc. So this year, it looks like Pakistan is getting more of an impact of that. And second, again, when I read the Pakistani Met department's analysis, it looks like the monsoon trough this year is more to the south than before. And that might be the reason why, why this south of India, peninsular India has got quite a bit of rain. Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan have got quite a bit of rain. West Rajasthan has got a lot, lot of rain. But eastern UP and Bihar, which happen to be in a different, different zone, more to the north, they haven't got it. Once again, I am not a Met expert, but because these were the few factors that I had read about and I had forgotten to mention these earlier. I thought I'll add today. Once again, making CTC shorter is a work in progress. I know it's still not short enough, but I'm trying to get to that magical 15 minute mark. So keep track of CTC and watch my progress towards making it shorter and snappier.